friends, I'm Ralchire, and I've got a super exciting topic for you today. I'm going to be talking about these weapons. Now, what is this weapon, you might ask? It's kind of just like a metal stick on a wooden stick. It's decently long. It's got a hole right there, and a couple holes right there, and oh, here's, here's the giveaway, a hole right there. If you haven't guessed already this is a hand cannon this is the first type of black powder infantry weapon in europe and so it's a far cry from the muskets and arquebuses that are commonly referred to as early firearms this is as old school as it gets it's a handgun that's gun spelled g-o-n-n-e -N -N -E, because we history nerds have to be persnickety about our spelling to differentiate it from like a modern handgun or revolver some people put, call them hand cannons but those people often get criticized for not being persnickety enough. And we don't want that, do we? I certainly don't. So, handguns it is then. I've got one here. I've got two, actually. And these are the earliest and most minimal of what you'd consider handheld firearms. I'll start by running you through my guns and how you would fire them. And then I'm going to give you some historical background into the actual commonality and the development of these things. So you can actually solidify in your mind when where and how these were used. Indeed, gunpowder weapons like the handgun were in prevalent use in Europe in the medieval period and deserve more love from us medieval enthusiasts and history nerds. So let's dig in. First, they are held on a wooden pole called a tiller. Sometimes it's just a straight piece of wood. Other times there's a lot more taper towards it, towards the end. Some of them could be shaped more like a gun stock, but the earliest ones, they were just straight like this. At any rate, it has to be long enough to keep the explosion right here away from your face and eyes. So often they're held quite far out just because of safety. These weapons have no moving parts whatsoever, at least the early ones. There's no trigger, no safety, not even any sights. They're smooth bore, usually of a fairly large caliber. Both of mine are .625 caliber, and I don't know of any historical pieces less than .50 caliber. Though in period, they didn't have much of a distinctive system for measurements anyway, so you probably would have seen wildly different results. You'd of course load this through the muzzle, first with the powder and then with the ammunition. Interestingly, they didn't only fire lead, lead balls. The earliest kind shot crossbow bolts called Garrett. They could also shoot small stones, and I find it particularly frightening that it was quite common actually to load lots and lots of little shards of flint to use as grape shot. You can imagine many small razor sharp pieces of broken flint flying through the air in a cone of almost certain laceration being quite terrifying, even with the relatively poor accuracy these weapons suffered from. This right here is the touch hole, and you would load a fried gunpowder, a much finer powder than what is used in the barrel for the charge, as a priming powder. This is what would catch fire first, and then it would spread down to the large grains of gunpowder down in the touch hole and into the chamber, and then that would explode and propel your bullet. Now that it's loaded, how are we going to fire it off? The earliest methods of doing this were just wires that were kept hot in charcoal and then would be pulled out when needed, red hot. The red hot iron would touch the priming powder and then bang. The problem was that obviously you had to stay next to your fire so you could get your wire red hot when you needed to fire off your gun. Not much later, people made match cord soaked in saltpeter. The slow match could be lit and the end of the rope would smolder very, very slowly at a rate about one foot per hour. This was put on the end of a stick called a linstock, which like the wire was long enough that you could touch the slow match to the touch hole without getting your hands too close. Like so. Despite this innovation, it was quite easy and common for people just to choke down on the, the match a little bit, not use a linstock, and fire that way. Later models of handgun Later models of handgun put an S-shaped linstock riveted to the tiller that would act like a trigger, kind of like the way a crossbow trigger functions. This is called a serpentine lock, and it's the earliest type of match lock. The problem with these is that your bit of cord at the end would smolder away and get shorter and shorter and shorter, so that at some point your match cord wouldn't hit the touch hole at all. The guns were aimed and fired in plenty of different ways. Sometimes they would be held under the arm like a couch lance and fired that way. Sometimes they would be held over the shoulder, like a rocket launcher, fired that way. Or you could hold the gun with both hands and focus entirely on aiming, 
while a second guy gives fire to the gun when you call for it. Some types of handguns had little hooks at the bottoms, so you could hook them over battlements or windows, and that would take away some of the recoil from your shot. You could even hook them over a pavis or hang it up on a metal tripod or fork. That could result in being blinded just by the flash and unable to see for a little bit, which is not really good in the combat situation. Or exploding gunpowder could get into your eye and you would get blind from that. So instead you aim sort of instinctively, like you do with a bow or a sling. Just sort of point in the general direction and where you feel that bullet will probably hit, as you're, you're probably right. There's not a whole lot of aiming to do with this sort of weapon anyway. As mentioned before, these weapons have quite poor accuracy in comparison to something like a bow, or especially a crossbow. But they were used against large masses of men anyway, so as long as you're not aiming too high or too low, you'll probably hit something in that direction. So it's often said that handguns had very little battlefield effect, and were just designed to scare the enemy with loud noises. I find that particularly silly. There's so much going on in a battle, with all the clamor and yelling and dying and the trampling and neighing of horses and the screaming and shouting of orders that I think a crack from a metal tube and some small faraway puff of smoke is really not going to even register into your mind. Especially after black powder weapons had seen prolific use on the European battlefield, say after the year 1400, the shock and awe would have worn off significantly among the professional fighting men who had seen this thing countless times before. So anyway, would a commander even field his troops with a load of dangerous, unreliable, explosive noisemakers instead of real weapons? No, the fact that they were used indicates to me that they were effective for the context in which they were used. And the context, we think, was against large, slow-moving formations of men. Even with a fairly inaccurate firearm, an untrained soldier could probably hit one guy out of a whole line of spearmen, for instance. And at close range, they had the most stopping power of probably any handheld weapon in the period. Even against things like armor, they'd totally beat a couch lance or the highest pounders crossbows or longbows. There were several ways handgunners might be deployed in the battlefield. In the field, they would often be mixed with archers and crossbowmen. Due to the different reload times of these weapons, there would be an almost continuous barrage of arrows, bolts, and bullets coming from these mixed unit formations which would have certainly stopped any direct charge. There are accounts, though, of units consisting entirely of handgunners, so mixed unit tactics weren't the only way to do it. Taken in a more defensive role, there was a tactic known as the Wagenberg, which means wagon fort. This was made very popular in Central Europe during the Hussite Wars. Fortified wagons would be filled with ranks of gunners and crossbowmen, and then they would be chained together and form a ring. Men with pavises would fill the gaps between the wagons, and over them would be polearm users, such as halberdiers, flail users, and spearmen. Anyone who got too close to these wagons would be taken care of by the polearm users, and anyone too far away would be faced with a barrage of handgun fire. An interesting form of artillery was the ribaldi, or ribaudio, which would have three or more small cannons or handguns affixed to the front of it, which would fire in multiple different directions at once. Very effective for firing at large masses of armored men. So now let's talk a bit about gunpowder in European warfare, generally speaking. It's clear that gunpowder was known in Europe by the 13th century. Roger Bacon wrote down a formula for gunpowder in the year 1267, as did Albert the Great in 1275, and Marcus Grecus about 1300. In 1268, Bacon said, By the flash and combustion of fires, and by the horror of sounds, wonders can be wrought, and at any distance that we wish, so that a man can hardly protect himself or endure it. There is a child's toy of sound and fire made in various parts of the world with powder of saltpeter, sulfur, and charcoal of hazelwood. This powder is enclosed in an instrument of parchment the size of a finger, and since this can make such a noise that it seriously distresses the ears of men, if the instrument were made of a solid material, the violence of the explosion would be much greater. He makes a clear reference to firecrackers here, but it also gives perhaps the first reference to the idea of a grenade or a bomb. This is well in line with the conventional knowledge of gunpowder, that it came from China and it was first used in firecrackers. However, this is gunpowder being used in explosive rather than as a propellant. Even in China, which is now in the 13th century, has had gunpowder for hundreds of years, it's only now beginning to use it as a propellant in their hand cannons. 
This video is about European hand cannons, not Chinese ones, but it's interesting that both kinds are nearly identical, and the evidence suggests were developed independently. The first medieval cannons were known as pots de fer, that is, iron pots, in France or and vasi, or vases, in Italy. The first example we see is in a manuscript of 1327 by Walter de la Millimette, though the picture could be a copy of a much older image. There were large, bulbous, vase-shaped cannons that shot arrow-like projectiles called garrets. These cannons were inferior in almost every respect to great siege engines, like trebuchets or even mangonels. They were small, slow to reload, and limited to firing garrets, which had a very small affected range. They couldn't be cast or forged in one piece due to the limitations in metallurgical technology, so they were made of thick iron hoops, forge welded together. They weren't very reliable in construction. Many of these great constructs would explode in the line of duty, wounding, wounding and killing men operating them. Still, I think the unreliability of cannons is a bit overstated at times. In contemporary illustrations of medieval cannons, you often see them built right up against castle walls. It's something to think about when we think about how these weapons were deployed. So cannons were certainly used in England by the early 14th century. Edward III deployed field artillery at Crecy in 1346, and six years prior, a French cannon was captured by the English at Sluys. At Crecy, Jean Frassat says the English kept quite still and fired off some cannons which they had in their battle formation and mentions the firing of two or three bombards. Another account of the same battle by Giovanni Villani states the English guns cast iron balls by means of fire. They made a noise like thunder and caused much loss in men and horses. The Genoese were continually hit by the archers and the gunners, the whole plain covered by men struck down by arrows and cannonballs. During the 1340s though, Cannons were still relatively rare and were only used in small numbers by a few armies. By the 1380s, many English castles had provision for cannons and handguns to be fired from the walls. The town of Harfleur was won with cannons by Henry V in 1415, and his army came under artillery fire in Agincourt. The Hussite Wars in the 1340s, as I already mentioned, saw extensive use of fortified wagon tactics, and in 1453, the French won the Battle of Castillon using 300 pieces of artillery. These were the heavy cannons designed to destroy castles. In 1408, Harlech Castle saw its curtain walls breached in two places by cannon fire, and numerous other castles around this time would have had the same fate. Handguns follow a similar time frame to cannons in general. By 1338, France had at least started using them to a degree. There are records of the purchase of 500 handguns by the Italian town of Perugia, presumably for use by the city's garrison, in 1364. The last three decades of the 14th century are so littered with handgun finds and some in very good condition, but some are so rusted that we can't really tell what size their bore was even. By the end of the Hussite Wars in the 1430s, roughly one-fifth of all armies in Europe fielded a fair amount of handgunners. But by the mid-15th or late 15th century, the handgun was supplanted by the Matchlock Arquebus. Gunpowder was expensive though, it's because Europeans didn't know how to produce their own saltpeter in those days, and had to import it from the east at great cost. Though the price of import didn't stop development of gunpowder, Europeans definitely saw the value in finding a way to produce their own. Often we'll imagine the early gunpowder was some sort of alchemist's closely guarded secret. If that was the case, we'd certainly not have seen so many different nations adopt gunpowder so quickly. The recipe for gunpowder was common knowledge amongst those who needed to know it. The knowledge of how to make saltpeter, however, was not. In 1388, when in Frankfurt the first European saltpeter plantation was opened, the cost of gunpowder in Europe dropped significantly. Soon more plantations followed, and these were made of pits with leaves and straw mixed with slaked lime, which were kept at more or less the same temperature year-round, and were regularly sprinkled with animal urine, or urine from a wine-drinking man. The ammonia in a drunkard's urine apparently helps speed up the process, but let's not go there. There are all sorts of manuscripts of various cannons, bombards, mortars, and handguns dating from the 1320s all the way to 1450 and of course beyond that. So there are certainly isn't a question of their existence, or even really a question of their frequency. To put this into perspective, 
Full plate armor was invented after black powder weapons were. Think about that. If you ever see a guy dressed like this, or this, or this, he's actually wearing armor that was developed after gunpowder weapons were already in full swing. Yet so often I see people ignoring the concept of gunpowder when discussing medieval warfare. Maybe we don't like the concept of firearms because they're too close to the modern way of warfare. Swords and bows are somehow romantic and idealized, yet cannons and handguns are overlooked because of their lack of charm. There might be something there, but regardless, I think gunpowder deserves its rightful place in these discussions. If you're looking for the weapon with the most stopping power of any weapon in the medieval period at close range, it's going to be a hand cannon. If we can think of the most prevalent ranged weapons on the late medieval battlefield, they are the longbow, the crossbow, and the handgun. You can obviously shoot more quickly with the longbow, but they take so much more practice to st and strength to be able to pull back and accurately shoot. You can just point and shoot crossbows, but they take a fair bit of time to load and they're not at all cheap to manufacture. Handguns take roughly the same amount of time to load, maybe a little longer than crossbows, and are much less accurate and shoot more expensive ammunition yet they themselves are much simpler and cheaper to make. They require very similar training to the crossbow, and they have much more stopping power at close range than a crossbow or even a longbow. So that's all for today, everyone. I hope I brought something new to your attention, and let me know what you thought. Thanks for watching, and I'd really like to thank everyone, because I've recently just passed 100 subscribers. That's incredible. Thank you, everyone. I started this channel in January of 2018, and I really appreciate you all helping me get this far. Here's to an even better 2019. Godspeed, friends.